Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. We now return to our interview with Mike Myler, discussing the finer points of primordial D&D in Vast Cavia, coming to Game On Tabletop very soon. Enjoy. Uh, you, you do have some uh, sub-races and, and class archetypes and uh, new classes. Without getting too far into uh, all of them, what are some of your favorite sub-races, your archetypes, and your new classes that you've put in? Okay, well, sub-races, uh, I like the Mistlings, but that's mostly just because I love halflings. They're like telepathic uh, little little jungle halflings, and I just love that idea. The Genasi are pretty cool, uh, but I'm biased because I wrote the Genasi, so I just wanted to have more of them. There's now Acid, Ash, Mist, and Mud Genasi. And then for classes... Uh, the hive mind, which is in the primer, made it in there. It's a really slick idea. Um, I don't. I, I was surprised there wasn't already a hive mind warlock patron. But yeah. Oh. Uh, one of the warlords is also in the primer. It's called um, Togai the Awakened Reef. It's this body of coral that gains sentience and like kind of enslaves the minds of the creatures that live nearby it. And then every nice. year when the storms come in and break the coral, uh, it gets destroyed and comes back a little bit stronger. And if you take the Hive Mind Warlock Patron, then the Coral is your patron. Well, I mean, you could have another one you make up for yourself, but the Coral is meant to be your patron. Uh, the Monster Tamer class is awesome. Uh, there are two classes that are like full classes in there, the Gemini and the Monster Tamer. They uh, also appeared on EN World, uh, on the EN Insider Patreon, so they already had like a thousand people or so. Uh, give, them, give them the rundown and playtesting. Another project called a Touchmore class already went off and, and, and did quite well. We're getting even more feedback from people, so um, highly refined. I'm playing uh, Monster Tamer right now in Storm King's Thunder, actually. Uh, his name is Ned Heavy Cavern. He has a giant subterranean lizard he calls Jimbo. Uh, <laughs> they are wonderful to play as. Perfect. It's essentially like a tank class. Mm -hmm. So, like, mechanically, it's, it's similar to the Barbarian in the fact that you get you sort of get double hit points, right? Mm. And the Barbarian sort of gets double hit points because they get resistance to, to damage, which is the same thing. You can transfer hit points around, but like the Monster Tamer themselves is is basically a sack of hit points that is kind of good with a whip. Mm -hmm. And it's all about whatever creature it is that you've tamed as your monster. Mm. Anything under an intelligence of five, you can try to tame and, and make your, your pet. And um, then you command them through tricks. It's really neat. I really like the Monster Tamer class. Yeah, the one, the Beastmaster, even the revised Beastmaster just kind of falls short of, I think, everyone's expectations for what you should be able to do taming monsters. And I mean, let's see, what was the other really cool class archetype that people keep telling me that I loved a lot? Yeah, the Burning Druid, uh, which is uh, a druid that's all about burning shit. You get a bunch of fire spells, and then you can also choose not to set things on fire, like inanimate objects and plants and things whenever you cast them. What is the, the Gemini class? So the Gemini class is sort of like um, an agile warrior because the fighter can't really do that. The monk carries all of this baggage with it. And so the, the Gemini is this person who's, when you, when you choose it, you also choose a balance. I wouldn't say you have split personalities. That's maybe a little, a little too far, but it's sort of in that vein. What's the good example? There's a new archetype in the book that didn't appear with the original Gemini. It's called uh, Nick Semeron. So like during the day, you get a different features from your archetype than you do at night. So at night, you're better being sneaky and quick. And then during the day, you're better being strong and, and tough. This is like if I take the right character uh, perks in Fallout, where if I take like the night person and the solar powered. That specific archetype, yeah. Uh, the other ones are like uh, the reluctant hero is like when you wake up in, in, every day, you roll a d20. On an even result, you are um, a coward, so you're like hard to convince, and you get other abilities like that. And then on an odd result, you're you're fearless, and you know it's hard to make you afraid, and you get bonuses for being courageous. Uh -huh. And so yeah, all the archetypes have those that that sort of dualism to them. And then the way that the the class actually functions is you get these semi real. Whenever you would get extra attack, you mm. uh, whenever a fighter would get extra attack, six, eleven, twentieth. Um, you get uh, these semi-real duplicates. So you kind of create a, a mirror image effect, mm. but unlike mirror image, your your duplicates are A, a little harder to hit, and B, uh, can actually deal damage. Oh, okay. So you go to strike a creature. Also, your semi-real duplicates go to strike a creature. Oh. And so as long as you still have them, you can 
do damage output on the same level as a fighter, but you're harder to hit and you don't need to be wearing plate mail for that. That's pretty useful. I could definitely see that being something I would definitely not exploit uh, in any way, shape, or form. Um, no, no, it's cool, man. And in, in like I said, it's they've gotten a whole ton of playtesting and tweaks. So if anything, the Gemini is maybe a little less powerful than a fighter, but more versatile. And they also get some some charisma friendly thing. Yeah, that's nice. But they're a little bit more swayed in their usefulness depending on uh, some exterior factors. It feels like, like Correct. you know, depending on what archetype you've chosen yeah. and whether the dice are rolling in your way, or mm-hmm. in the case of Nick Demeron, uh, whether it's an ender day. Right. Gotcha. One other thing I wanted to touch on with uh, classes is where we have uh, primal shamans that have uh, a version of psionic powers. When you say primitive psionic powers, what does that actually entail? First, I should briefly explain our take on prestige classes. I did not like the way that Unarthed Arcana did prestige classes, and nobody else did either. Uh, that's why they haven't done it anymore. When I make the Book of Exalted Darkness, which is a wonderful book if you love evil stuff or are into like uh, the Rocketeer and Decopunk, check it out. My, one of my designers, uh, a guy named Luis Loza, he now has a full-time job at Paizo. Congratulations, Luis. We're all still jealous of you. Uh, I told him, I want you to do prestige class for 5e, but you can't do it the way they did it because it sucks. Uh, and what he ended up doing was this like 8th level design you know you have to be at least fifth level or so to even qualify for it and then you you sink enough in there where it's not going to be worth it for somebody just to level dip because that i found was pretty common with uh 3.5 prestige classes a because they made so many prestige classes for fifth or third edition and then b like they didn't tier abilities well and they made them too accessible by having prestige classes be just three or five levels sometimes yeah we've we followed that like eight level design structure and there's the elementalist so if you want to be like i turn into fire i control fire like cool we want you to do that then there's the fractured soul which is like a if you want to just do shape shifting but you don't want to also be a druid come be a factor fractured soul magic eaters which are uh do you guys remember uh forsakers from three three point oh well they're basically like screw magic of all kinds i will not accept healing i will not use magic items I will, if somebody tries to cast a nice spell on me, I'll punch him in the face. What, what is this? Is this Oath of Poverty? Uh, kind of. I would say it's a more aggressive Oath of, of Poverty, sort of. Yeah, you just get really good resisting magic, and then you get bonuses for doing it. And then, yeah, the Primal Shaman is, so I think, like, uh, it's, it's very much like an eight spell casting without components. So you don't need, uh, you still need material components. But um, so whenever you cast a Sonic Spell without being noticed, uh, you have to make a, in order to not be noticed, rather, you need to make a sleight of hand or deception check, uh, opposed by, like, wisdom perception or wisdom insight, the people nearby. And, you know, the GM, just to make things faster, may just say that you're using passive perception or passive insight. Sure. And as long as you succeed on that check, nobody will see that you cast a spell. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Uh, but they only get up to fourth level spells, so, it, you know, they're, right. they're primal shamans, they're not, you know, fully fledged, uh, well-developed culturally uh, refined shaman no yeah i i only say that because it feels like in general the setting does not really lend itself to a lot of like refined characters that like to use uh words to solve their problems a lot it feels like this is more like trial by combat kind of setting to touch on on words uh if you are using common and you only share common with the person you're talking to Mm. and you talk uh at a higher Great a sophistication than the GM thinks a 10 year old could do. <laughs> you have to succeed on an intelligence check against like your listener's insight, passive insight score, or they will misunderstand. You. Oh, cool. <laughs> so, like, it really matters that you get other languages and share languages with the speakers because, like, that's something that bothers me too. If I hand you a book in common, why can we all read Finnegan's Wake? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> right. So there's a certain level of interpretation that you might have depending on on who the reader is. And it encourages role play when you can't just, you know, fall back on your your strong conversational English. Right. Well, yeah, I can imagine that so. if you have somebody who has like an intelligence score of like 5, common you, you know, you can try to be very eloquent, but it, a lot of it's probably going to go over their heads. <laughs> It's it's like exactly like that thing in Fallout where if you just set your intelligence to one and you just go and have conversations with people, your conversation options are, are terrible because no one can understand. Exactly, exactly. Can understand what you're saying. And like unlike Fallout, you're gonna be at a table or, you know, able to like, you know, 
explain like okay well my character will you know point to the ground and like draw out a simple diagram of like what what the dragon looks like you know like it it encourages role playing that wouldn't happen otherwise but really should i'd like to poorly draw a dragon on the ground a stick dragon that's what i'm saying yeah oh there are stick dragons now no i just you have to learn to communicate without relying on language and there are also a few options that you've added in the amnesiac background i think is what strikes me uh, the most. Is this literally a background where I don't remember who I am from the past? That is correct, yeah. Okay. Uh, you get a random set of clothing, um, You and then like there's this feature you get called Remember. So during play, you experience sudden insights into your past, discovering one forgotten skill, one forgotten tool proficiency, one forgotten language, and, and at least one old friend. Um, hmm. So whenever you take an ability check for a, a skill or tool, uh, you can possibly... And not not like repeatedly, but once you can get proficiency in that skill or tool because you realize that you you are proficient, you just forgot. I remembered how mm. to use this hammer now. Mm. Exactly. It's like the Jason Bourne uh, background. Yeah, I know I can do amazing things, but I don't want know why. A lot of people talk about like playing games where you know you don't know what your attributes are. Only the the GM has the sheets, and you just have to role play to find out what they are. Well, this is that codified in the mechanic. The problem with that kind of model for me is I would have, like, a sheet out, like, kind of going, okay, how much did they add to the score? Now I have to figure out what my yeah. stats are. <laughs> Am I good at this? Of course, they probably just kind of go, yeah, you do some damage. Yeah, you succeeded. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a fun meme, but in practice, it would end up being too much too much note-taking and occlusion math to be, like, really fun and practical. Yeah, uh, because you'd always be looking for hints from the GM uh about like exactly. what it oh okay like like you have your blank uh stat sheet and you're trying to fill in the blanks as you go along uh but if you have a really cryptic gm they could conceivably withhold all of that information from you what no they would never do that who would do such a thing yeah well you know it's it's possible i mean there's no reason that you couldn't say uh okay what did you roll and you tell them what you roll and they'll just say yeah, that did something. <laughs> that doesn't really explain if it. If I mean, it's I feel like they would describe out like what happened. Oh yeah, no, but they but they don't have to do it by telling you like by how much or like. Yeah, they don't have to number. tell you numbers. They can just yeah. describe it. Oh, your sword yeah. slides across the scales. And right. Doesn't bend very. And you you just know there's going to be that one guy with like a charisma and a minus one who keeps rolling twenties on persuasion check. Yeah, <laughs> at twenty. I must be the bard. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I don't. I don't like the ones where you you don't know like any of your class stuff at all because that's really hard to play character. Like, what am I good at? I don't know. Pick up a sword. Can I use it? Not really. How about magic? I don't remember any of magic. Uh, how are you gonna try to do magic said, if you don't remember? It's a good it? meme, but like it, it, when you sit down to actually do it after an hour, everyone's gonna be like, Arr. "Well, like, just yeah. tell me." Yeah. <laughs> do yeah. I have sneak I... attack, or are you just describing it like I have sneak attack? But I just I think uh. I think that it's gonna be a really good way for a party to die fast. Because if literally I go in <laughs> and I have no idea what I'm good at, maybe I'm supposed to be a spellcaster. Maybe I'm a wizard. And I go, okay, I'm gonna pick up this sword, and you just get run through by the first guy that comes up to you. Because you don't even know if you can do spells. I don't even know if I can do spells. Can I cast fireball? Try. No, just tell me if I can or not. Okay, try to cast Fireball. Nope, didn't work. Oh, damn it. I, I feel like that is going to make it very hard to figure out what, do you, what you do in any given time. Neat idea, but unless you do like the Jason Bourne thing where you can pull out the right skill at the right time when it becomes applicable. Yeah, it becomes muscle memory then. Oh, you figure it out, you know how to block with a sword. What, yeah. I do? Yeah. I feel like that's the point, though, where the GM is basically just playing the entire game without the player's input. That sounds boring. Sure does. <laughs> I think the, the slowdown would be in, in the GM and the player translation, yeah. I think. But with the amnesiac background, I'm guessing that you at least have a pretty good idea of like what your stats and everything are at the start. Yeah, yeah, you know that you... I mean, it, it grants survival as a given skill, and then like you figure out a contact... And, and a couple of other small things. But for the most part, you'll have your sheet in front of you and know, like, oh, right. okay, I'm first little barbarian, I got these features. You can literally be Hancock with that one. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, you're yes. not playing Hancock. 
You have really so you've been you've been binging the TBS then, have you? <laughs> no, I just I thought about it the other night. I don't know why I saw it earlier this year because I hadn't seen it before, and um, oh, it's worth watching once at least. Yeah, no, I hadn't seen it, and I was on vacation. We watched it, and I was like, "Wow, this is actually a really good movie." Like, and the plot is actually really good. I think that might be a slight exact. The plot wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I don't know if yeah, I thought it, it was really great. good. Like, it was a, you didn't expect it. It was fantastic. I was like, did not see that coming. No, I definitely did not see the movie Hancock coming <laughs> until it was on my doorstep. <laughs> Who doesn't want to play a drunk superhero? <laughs> <laughs> that was the best part of the movie, though, where he's trying to fly and he's drunk. One slight caveat. I like that you are a challenge rating, too. Thank you. Congratulations. When, we, when you do successful campaigns, do you get a better challenge rating? For yourself? No, that's mostly just because it's like super hard to knock me out and I can run very far. Okay. <laughs> that, that was my thinking there. No one else. Oh, well, no, your artist. Your artist got a CR4, so congratulations. Yes. <laughs> Indy's a badass. Yep. Yep. Do not yeah. mess with Indy. I do like that little touch, though, if you, uh, if you get a chance to look at Kavian designers. Uh, everybody has a challenge rating. I think that that should be like a requirement for uh, books from now on that the staff uh, has to have a challenge rating. Well, credit for that idea has to go to Will Gond, because he did it, and then uh, one or two other people wrote it for their bios, and I was like, well, I guess we're all going to get challenge ratings. So. Perfect. Can't do it for three people and not for everybody, right? Right. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, Vascavia. It's going to be coming on to uh, crowdfunding soon, uh, but it is not on Kickstarter. It is on Game On Tabletop. Tell me a little bit about Game on Tabletop. I haven't heard of it before now. Uh, why are you doing your campaign over there? Okay, so I met the Game on Tabletop folks uh, at PAX Unplugged. I can't remember if it was last year or the year before. It was the first PAX Unplugged that they did. They're very nice, and I like them all. And I was like, hey, I'm going to do a project with you sometime. See how it goes. Because they're basically like the European version of Kickstarter, and very specifically only for tabletop games. Sure. So Game on Tabletop will only have board games and, and RPGs on it. And then uh, we were set up on Kickstarter. I actually have the whole project page set up on Kickstarter. And one of the designers came to me and was like, hey, man, did you see this article about uh, Kickstarter doing union busting? And so then I, I was like, no, let me check it out. And my initial reaction, because he was like, well, are we going to keep doing it on Kickstarter? I was like, no, yeah, probably. Because like, typically uh, management will have a knee-jerk reaction to organizing workers, no matter where, where the hell you're talking about. And that can be fixed, right? Like, you can walk that back and be reasonable oh, yeah. and, and treat your workers with respect and dignity. Yeah, they often do. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah most of the time, that's what happens. Uh, and then I, I researched and found out, like, why the workers were unionized. So what happened was, somebody did this Kickstarter campaign for a satire comic called Always Punch Not. And then Breitbart wrote a bad article about Kickstarter, and Kickstarter management was like, pull that anti-Nazi comic book. And that's what caused oh. all the workers to be like, yo, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and want to have more of a word what goes on. Yeah. And I have this real huge problem with Nazis. So, like, if you're going to be Fair. a company that wants to placate Nazis, mm -hmm. you can you can fuck right off. <laughs> I um, mean, hopefully so, everyone listening has a real problem with Nazis. <laughs> yeah, I, I would know. hope If so. you are a Nazi and you got a problem with me, you can, you can also fuck right off. There you but, go. Um, Square up with me right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that would have not been my uh, thing. Come to Squirrel Hill. We have lots of opinions about you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and for what it's worth, uh, Kickstarter is like their their employees are trying to unionize, and they don't want people to boycott Kickstarter. Uh, I right. if I didn't have a huge problem with Nazis, I wouldn't be boycotting Kickstarter. But that's that's where we are. Right. So uh, yeah. yeah, we moved it over to Game on Tabletop. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, that would have not been my first reaction. Like, oh well, what we we gotta do is we gotta uh, pull that Kickstarter. I would have been, <laughs> I would have been like, yeah, no, you thing I've it. spent like almost a fucking year working on. Yeah, yeah no, it, it was a not a simple, quick decision. Yeah, and we the design team talked about it, and some people were like, look, like you know, the management changed their minds, and and I'm just. If you're going to placate Nazis once, you're going to placate Nazis again, and I'm not going to be part of it. Right, so. yeah. I, I mean, I just don't understand why you'd want to pull a, a Kickstarter based on a, an article. Bad news is still traction for you. I mean, it's it's more about the chaos management. Yeah. wanted yeah. to grab their ankles for Nazis, and I'm not going to give them any of my money. Right, period. right. Absolutely. Like, I've raised um, over $50,000 on Kickstarter, which for them uh, amounts to, I think, like five grand. Mm -hmm. So probably like one week. 
for one Kickstarter manager, but like I don't care. They're not allowed to have it. You, right, right, right. On a side note, I mean, Alex, you probably don't know, but I mean, they they pretty much like pulled the movie The Hunt because all of a sudden Fox News had a problem with it, and and the president started uh, berating it on on. <laughs> On, even though no one had actually seen it, yeah, that was an entirely finished film too. Like they were done. Oh yeah, for, like yeah, sending it to theaters. And ironically, it was probably more sympathetic to the right than anything else, and was a commentary on um, high-minded elitism more than anything else. But since they didn't see the film and they didn't understand that, <laughs> they they decided bad movie. <laughs> But the ironic thing is now, you know that when that film actually does get released, everyone's going to want to go and see it. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, because of course they're going to. So now you're going to do it over on, on Game On Tabletop, and uh, it's going to be coming out. Uh, how has that been setting it up uh, compared to like putting it on Kickstarter? Because I know you had your, your reasons to not do it on Kickstarter, but uh, comparative to that. Well, so one of the reasons I wanted to do it on Game On Tabletop is because they have, a, a, frankly, a much better interface all around mm. so like a you have more control on over how things are presented in the page like there's more than two sizes of font you can access oh wow <laughs> uh, kickstarter yeah exactly right mind blown you can your own types of font and then at the top of the uh, i really love this at the top of the the game on tabletop like project page there's tabs first tab is for the project second tab is for product previews and then one for comments and updates Product previews tab is awesome. So like you click on that and then it shows you all the stuff that you can get through the Kickstarter and like you float over it and it like there's a written description. And then if you click it, you can look in like a zoomed in picture of whatever the product is. Oh, wow. Right. And Kickstarter has all this freaking money. Why don't they have something like this? Yeah. I mean, why would you want to rebuild your website to do stuff like that when you can just make profits? I don't know if you'd have to totally rebuild your website to do something like that. But you got you to gotta pay someone to do it, though. No, no, for sure. Somebody would have to do it. It would cost some money, but like I, I, I imagine the return on investment would be more than enough Probably. to justify doing it. So, like all, all told, it's just slicker. And so there was some more setup time involved. But like I said, I already had the Kickstarter page done, so I just kind of moved most of the content and and written graphics and all that stuff over to nice, table. nice. Yeah, as I just kind of like look around the game on tabletop, I like this idea of the coming up page so that you can see some of the projects that are you know t minus five days t minus three days which which is good because you can actually start i mean the website itself can actually start drumming up a little bit of press a little bit of excitement for a project usually that's all on the developer the the producer itself yeah they, they offer to help with marketing and like they also have like uh it has an included back end so like there's no back kit required if you want to oh. be a late pledge you can just do it. That's great, because I don't like that you have to go through third parties to do stuff like that on Kickstarter. Mm. And they'll also do some, like, warehousing and shipping if you really want them to. They're, oh, like, wow. nah, it's, it's awesome. I'm surprised. I think what they're doing is they're, they're doing, like, a real slow burn type thing, mm. where they want to, like, carefully, confidently build up their company and services in a responsible manner. Mm -hmm. uh, probably because they're from Europe and not America, where we're just like, do it all now! <laughs> And with that voice and with that level of aggression, that's, that's about right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that much enthusiasm. That I mean, it, it serves us well, but there's a time and a place for it, and sometimes uh, it's not all the time. Right. The idea of late pledges is really interesting. I've had my share of, um, of, of times where they do a campaign, and I'll be like, oh, this sounds really great. I go on, it's already over. Like, I just found out. Oh. It's like, I, I didn't see anything about this. <laughs> before this moment right now i don't know if that's necessarily your fault but it's just i i it did not get in front of my eyeballs before it was already over so why didn't you lick your eyeballs at the thing nathan i don't lick my eyeballs anymore alex they fixed that so Voskavia is going to be on game on tabletop starting in october correct yes october 8th is our launch day excellent how long does the campaign go for uh, I'm planning right now on 25 days. Uh, that might change depending on what Game on Tabletop's team suggests, but it's probably going to end on November 3rd. There will be time for late pledges, but not a lot, because like I said, this book is written, so we're mostly just getting money so I can pay the writers and also buy more art. Sure. So uh, like our listed delivery date is June 2020, but I'm I'm expecting it to be more spring 2020, and I'm personally shooting for, like, February. I mean, like, if we, if we blow up a bunch of, like, stretch goals and, like, have a bunch of things to add to the book, that'll change. Sure. But uh, sans that, or any any additional work, I would imagine that you're still looking at a pretty tight schedule to get it out to people. 
And 40 pages of it are already laid out, so... Oh, wow. Well, that's pretty far along. Yeah, if you are listening to this before October 8th, uh, go to vastcavia.com, that's with a K, and there's a mailing list you can join. We'll tell you as soon as the project goes live. Uh, we'll also send you a copy of the, the primer PDF uh, early, so you don't have to wait for the to check it out. That way you know what you're backing. We'll also make sure to leave some links uh, in the description of the episode. The doobly do. Yeah, so that, so that you can go and, and check it out for yourself. So how has the mailing list worked for you in the past? Uh, so my uh, boss at Ian World, uh, Morris, uh, really pushed the mailing list for a touch more class. So I, I want to point out that a, he has a much wider reach than I do, right? He runs a, like the world's biggest RPG news website. Sure. And there was already a touch of class. So a touch more class was a sequel project to a touch of class. Mm-hmm. That said... Uh, day one of that Kickstarter was insane. Hmm. And at the end of it, I think it was like $94,000 we gained. So I immediately started setting up a mailing list like (laughs) that, that day after the first day of a touch more class. So I was like, Oh my God. So since we do mailing lists now, that seems to be helpful to get out information. Creates a good, uh, good, good resource to draw on for that, like, you know, super, super important day one push. Boy, it all comes down to day one now, doesn't it? I think part of it comes down to the fact that you want to have done enough ahead of time. Right. That when you launch, people have already heard of it and already looking forward to it and all that good stuff. What it boils down to is is just like metrics and statistics, right? So Game on Tabletop is still, I'm totally not sure if it operates the same way as as a Kickstarter does. Mm-hmm. Uh, because Kickstarter, it's incredibly formulaic. Like you will make a third of what your project will make in the first week. Right. You will know whether or not your project's going to succeed in the first three days. Mm-hmm. If you haven't made at least half of your funding by two weeks in, you will not probably make your funding. And you can look at hundreds and thousands of projects and like extrapolate this information. So it's not like, well, you know, we're looking at the bones. Like it, this is just the way that the numbers all. And uh, I, I don't know if Game on Tabletop is is like this, but I do know for most outlets is that uh, being able to see huge returns right up at the front also gets you more exposure, and then you're better seen. Oh, yeah. It has it has a snowballing effect. Yeah, there's a bunch of automated, like, robot flags where they see a Kickstarter has done X and X, and so you start getting emails from these things, like, let's help promote your thing, we'll only take 3% of your total, whatever. Yeah. It's really annoying running a Kickstarter because you get spammed the shit out of whenever it goes well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know, like, uh, on on YouTube and and those kinds of outlets is that, like, you know, if you see, like, in the first 10 minutes that you have something up, if you get X number of views, like, all of a sudden you're going to end up on recommended pages and all of that because, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like, ooh, something's big. Something's trending. Okay, yeah. And then you get on trending and then it just snowballs even further. Uh, so I imagine that there's some kind of similar metric going on behind the scenes at a lot of the crowdfunding outlets. Let's say, uh, I'm gonna try to actually run a game that's taking place in Voskavia. <laughs> that's a really bad idea for me, but let's say I do that. What is one big thing that you'd want me to remember, uh, that, that you'd want me to think about, uh, if I were running such a thing? Kavia, the, the, like, there is a, an adventure in the back of the book. It's called the Scorpion Sea Temple. So use that. Uh, I mean, I would say use that, yeah. Okay. Uh, the big thing to remember is the sense of scale and wonder. Mm. So, like, at the beginning of that that adventure, the PCs finally travel more than 20 miles from their, their home village, which they had never done in their entire life. And so everything is new. Every rumor is potential truth. Myths uh, turn out to be, like, you know, wild explanations for mundane phenomena that somebody just didn't totally understand when they saw it and you will realize this later and maybe you'll survive to bring it back to your your home but chances are you're never going to go back home why would you want to go home there's a world of adventure never ending possibility and the the vastness that's what i would say that really focus on the vastness of that sure so really focus on the vast part of that name <laughs> That's why it's called... That's why we are insisting on putting it on the, the title and everything. That's yeah. why it's called Vast Caviar. Vast Caviar? What? Yeah, I'm going to become a caviar farmer in, in Vast Caviar. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Could I do that? I'm wondering... I'm, <laughs> yeah, now I want to build my civilization near, like, you know, an, an oceanic, like, landscape so that I can try and get caviar. <laughs> That's going to be my how I make money. 
Uh, oh, I should mention there's more than just the core. So, like, you can get the campaign setting book, and there's also, like, an adventurer's handbook, which has, like, all the races and classes and, and like, a little bit more context for people who are going to play a game in there as opposed to GM. Oh, okay. Um, and there's a GM screen. So, oh, nice. Uh, and then I, we're going to open up with the two first, like, level up stretch goals revealed. So, um, yeah, we're looking for 2,500. Whenever we hit 3,500, the pay for all the writers, except for me, uh, doubles. Oh, nice. Because uh, nice. I really want to reward my writers. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when we hit 5,000, Jesse Jordan, uh, who is an upcoming tabletop game designer who designed this really great uh, warlord called the Wake of Maws, which are a bunch of intelligent undead dinosaurs. Nice. They're feeding for egg time, never realizing that egg time will never happen again. Oh, wow. Uh, he will do an adventure called, I think it's Hunger's Roar, uh, mm -hmm. that will also go into the back of the book and be a little higher level than Scorpion. Oh, beautiful. And we have other stuff planned too that that that, that are really neat, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, get to reveal in in October at some point. Perfect. Uh, I want to thank Mike Myler for coming back on the show. Thank you so much, Mike. Oh, thank you for having me again. It was, it was a good time. Oh yeah, always. I always learn uh, more than I expected to learn, and probably more than I should have. If uh, folks wanted to uh keep in touch with uh, you follow along with what's happening on Vascavia or what you do uh where could they find you on the internet uh the best place would probably be twitter uh i am at mike myler two uh m-y-l-e-r the number two Perfect. i'm also on the facebook and i have a website uh with a ton of really fun shit on it oh, nice. uh, if you've ever wondered what like cloud strife would look like in D 5e or professor moriarty or Yes, Rick and Morty, or uh, the cast of the first two Mortal Kombat games. Yes, so, uh, you get the idea. Uh, anything I can't make money off of, but I want to exist, uh, I put on my website. So you, you'll find stuff on there. I want all those things to exist. So <laughs> you're spot on. All well, the now they do. Now they do. Uh, you can definitely play Scorpion in uh, D and D Five E, or Sub Zero, or uh, Liu Kang, or. There's a Street Fighter PDF on there. Yeah, that's for your uh, barroom brawls. I just like the idea of Cloud Strike, just because I can have a a D and D version of a Buster Sword or something. That would be pretty great. Yeah, Tifa's on there. Yeah, uh, very Barrett, nice. Barrett, Kate Sith, Aerith, uh, Sephiroth. Oh, you got everybody. Nice. I, nice. I even did the Gang's first here. Final Fantasy characters, so you can find uh, Red Mage and and White Mage, Black Mage, oh and Black Belt. Wow. Uh, and then the Super Mario RPG Odyssey of Seven Stars. I got builds for all the main party in that. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. No, check out my website. It's it's really neat. It's fun. Neat. Okay. <laughs> Go there, look at the things, have fun. Yeah. yeah. And uh, make sure to send me uh, all applicable links, uh, and I will make sure to uh, also list those in the in the listings itself. And uh, Alex, if folks wanted to follow along with uh, the vast world of Delve, where could they go? You can find us at Delvecast.com. You certainly can. In addition to Delve, you can find all of the uh, videos and articles that we do over there. Uh, so please enjoy all of that. And make sure to uh, check out our Patreon. Become a patron. You can get extended episodes and some uh, Patreon exclusives for stuff that we talk about. Uh, all sorts of good stuff that you don't normally get uh, in the episode proper. Make sure to uh, check us out on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, pretty much everywhere where you can find podcast apps. And you can find us on Twitter. I am at Citanium. I'm at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. Yes. So follow there for all of your Delvey needs. There's, there's a lot of Delvey things that happen throughout the week. A lot of Delvinations. So many Delvinations. That needs to be a character class. The Delvinator. The Delviner. Del the Delviner. Ooh, that's the name. There's the. There yeah. we go. I'm great with names. The Delviner. The Delviner. For some reason, that just feels like a postmodern Vine app. I hate you so much. Al. Like you, you used to have, you used to have the <laughs> Vine stars, Delvine stars. <laughs> no, that's TikTok now, Nathan. Oh, sorry. We don't talk about TikTok. Sorry, it's TikTok. Anyway, thanks for joining us. Uh, <laughs> and again. Uh, thank you, Mike, for joining us. Thanks for having me on, guys. This is a good time. Yeah, it certainly was. And until next time, uh, we will see you until next time. <laughs> until next time, uh, thank you for joining us. <sighs> yeah, that doesn't work either. Until, <laughs> until next time, keep it real. Yes, keep it real, Delphi. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> 
Bye. Bye. Uh, Great outro. <laughs> Strong finish. <laughs>